Tom Goldsby, and uh, I will be your host and your speaker today for our masterclass session titled Technologies Enable Enabling Sustainability. And this is our kickoff session for the Sustainability Masterclass. Welcome to everyone. Again, I'm a professor at the University of Tennessee in beautiful Knoxville, Tennessee. I also serve as the Haslam Chair of Logistics. Uh, outside of my academic responsibilities, I also serve on some boards of uh, the board of directors for the Council of Supply Chain Management Professionals, also Supply Chain Leaders in Action, and I'm the, the immediate past editor of the Journal of Business Logistics. Really excited about this topic, uh, sustainability. I'm in fact wrapping up a book on this topic right now, and I'm just going to try to impart over the next 25 minutes or so some of the uh, the greatest hits, if you will, uh, some of my thinking around the topic of how technologies can help to enable sustainability. Uh, why are we here? What are we trying to accomplish? Again, some of you may be new to the masterclass series offered by Kerber Supply Chain, in which case I'll share with you that it's all about education. It's trying to get a better handle on the complexities and challenges that we're facing in our supply chains and perhaps turning those challenges into opportunities, perhaps even competitive advantage. So we're trying to get out ahead of practice, and I think today's topic is perfect for that, as is this entire masterclass dedicated to sustainability. In addition to today's class, you see that we have three subsequent sessions scheduled um, on the next couple of Tuesdays, as well as the following Thursday, rounding out the month of February. And we're, we're attacking sustainability from different angles uh, over the course of this masterclass series. Also, I encourage you to take a look at the previous masterclasses that we've offered on a variety of contemporary supply chain topics that you see listed there at the bottom of the screen. All of these classes, these were five and six session classes are available to you on demand. And, uh, they follow a very similar format to what we're going to do today. Again, action-packed 30-minute sessions with contemporary thought leaders and action leaders, uh, subject matter experts with deep expertise in each of these areas. So you're going to have access to this class uh, within 48 hours after its completion. And by virtue of uh, that link that takes you to this recording, you're also going to have access to all the other masterclass sessions that are available at the Kerber Supply Chain website. So just a little bit of housekeeping before we get into the topic, all of your phone lines are muted out there, uh, but we do want for you to be engaged with us today. And the way you do that is through your questions. You can ask questions at any time. I'm monitoring the question board as we speak and encourage you at any time today during the the session to submit your questions. I'm going to reserve some time at the end to address those questions. Also, in the GoToWebinar menu, you will find a handout to today's uh, handout, which is titled 15 Ways to Boost Sustainability, How to Make Your Supply Chain Greener. As we were arriving, I also asked you to complete a poll question. So why don't we go ahead and share the poll results uh, that ask, how are you implementing supply uh, sustainability in your business? And I, I think some pretty interesting findings here that 74% of you indicated technology adoption. And why? the reason I'm so intrigued by that is because a lot of people out there may not associate technology adoption as an effective strategy for sustainability. They would regard them as perhaps complimentary maybe in some ways, um, but uh, hey, you're at the right place today because we're gonna be focused on how technologies enable sustainability, higher levels of uh, being lean, green, and sustainable through advanced technologies. Next in, uh, in popularity was supply chain redesign. And again, I give a lot of credit uh, to so many of you that recognize that the design of your supply chain is really where sustainability needs to be baked in, if you will. It's very hard to achieve large, uh, substantial gains in sustainability once your supply chain is fully intact and, and perhaps rigid. And so redesigning your supply chain brings flexibility into the operation and a lot more opportunities 
to be more efficient, to be higher performing in the eyes of customers, and yes, also to be more sustainable. So it's great to see that more than half of you indicated that you're active in supply chain redesign. Next in, in frequency was labor safety at 42%. Again, uh, maybe many of you might be wondering how does labor safety relate to sustainability? It's because we are gonna take a broad view of sustainability, what I refer to as the triple bottom line orientation. And that very much starts with safety of your own employees as well as concern for the communities in which you operate. So I'm glad to see 42% of you uh, are recognizing that. And then tied at 37% uh, were the two, if you will, more obvious environmental overtures of packaging reduction and fuel efficiency energy management. And so I actually coming into this poll might have expected those to be among the more common uh, items. But thanks to everyone for uh, participating in the poll. We had a nice, robust response out there, and I think some pretty compelling results that helped to frame our discussion today. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get into the topic. And uh, as I said, I'd like to bring a, a very broad, holistic perspective to sustainability. And many of us that study and practice sustainability make reference to this expression of what sustainable development means. And this is a, an expression that's been around for more than 30 years now. It comes to us from the United Nations uh, World Commission of Environmental uh, Environment and Development, sometimes referred to as the Brooklyn Commission, that was uh, brought forward a, a major report called Our Common World that uh, define sustainability for many of us. This idea of meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And that's, that's kind of mind blowing to a lot of people that we are concerned not only for the here and now and the success of our businesses and our communities and larger society, but we're also concerned about those future generations. And it really does present a perplexing quandary about how we're expected to meet near-term objectives without compromising those longer-term objectives. Now, beyond this United Nations report, there was also a pretty instrumental piece of work done by a gentleman by the name of John Elkington. He had a book in 1998 that had a provocative title, Cannibals with Forks. And in that book, he introduced the notion of a triple bottom line. Now, I think all of us uh, are held accountable to an economic bottom line, profit and loss. However, Mr. Elkington suggests that there's also an environmental bottom line and a societal bottom line, and that our decision making and actions in business need to account for not only the economic bottom line, but also environmental and societal outcomes. And I've come to really embrace this triple bottom line orientation. And what you'll find is that sometimes, yes, in order to advance one of the bottom lines, one of the others has to sacrifice the nature of trade-offs. However, often there are opportunities in front of us that allow us to gain in the economic, environmental, and societal. And that calls for a great level of creativity. In my mind, a lot of excitement when you can have win-win-win outcomes. However, the truth be told, there are many circumstances in which these bottom lines are at odds with one another. And it's at that time that we need to engage in more deliberative decision-making and taking this longer view perhaps into consideration and yes, I do agree, I'm a business professor after all, that everything ultimately translates into an economic bottom line, but there is equity in doing what's right for environment and society. And that's what we're gonna explore in a little more depth in the session. Here's another view of sustainability as applied to the supply chain. And I give credit to some of my friends, colleagues at the University of Kentucky that I collaborate with, in fact, it's one of my collaborators there that were working on this book on sustain sustainable supply chains. And this image is, uh, it's, uh, it's pretty complicated. I, I agree, but if you start at the bottom, 
you recognize that there are different life cycle stages that we have. If you start in the upper left-hand corner of that kind of flattened disc, you see that we have pre-manufacturing, manufacturing use, and post-use stages. That's referred to the life cycle of a material or product. And what we're trying to encourage is that materials and products stay in the life cycle beyond a single use. And that's what's expressed by this upward spiral that you see in this diagram. And along with that upward spiral, you also see some R terms. Now, most of you are probably familiar with the three R's of reduce, reuse, recycle. In the United States, the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, made that an expression that was on the tips of our tongues back in the 1970s to reduce, reuse, recycle. You see those three terms represented here, but there are you you also see an additional three R terms here, recover, redesign, and remanufacture also brought into it. This is what we call a six R perspective. And the premise here is to really to try to keep those materials and products in flow, in use, beyond a single life cycle. And that's what, again, the upward trajectory suggests. Now, you notice that this thing takes on a little bit of a conical or cone shape as opposed to a cylinder. And what that means is that there is some loss of material and product that happens because we don't recover everything and reuse everything from one life cycle to the next. But there's also the notion of maybe we can reduce, maybe we can rely on less material and product moving forward. And so the footprint gets to be smaller perhaps as we take on a multi-life cycle perspective. And that's not entirely bad if we can get by serving the needs of our customers as well as society with less. And as population growth continues to, to climb around the world, well, you know, there is a resource conservation argument to be made that we need to figure out how to be more efficient in meeting our daily needs. And the supply chain can factor in very significantly to not only getting those products to market, but also as you see here in terms of recovery, remanufacture, reuse, recycling, keeping things in subsequent use. So let's go ahead and, uh, and march on. I, you'll, you'll hear me use the expression reframing. And here's one such expression of reframing the problem that we're faced with, is that all of us in logistics and supply chain operations are quite familiar with the two-dimensional problem that you see at the left, where we need to somehow enhance our cost efficiencies, and also meet today's very demanding customers, whether those are business customers or consumers. They're concerned about fill rates, speed, and reliability. And this has been the age-old quandary that we faced, particularly in logistics, as we try to provide the right product, the right place, right time, right quantity and condition for the customer at the lowest possible cost. And hey, there's no doubt that problem remains alive and well today into the 2020s. However, the problem as we start to embrace sustainability as another dimension, you see this arrow jump out at us because we need to continue to provide great service. We need to find opportunities to be cost efficient and competitive, yet we must also take the societal and environmental dimensions into consideration as well. And hence that arrow jumps out at us. And it's a beautiful day when we can arrive at a decision that delivers on all three of these dimensions. In that case, hey, have at it. That's, I, I don't wanna say it's a no brainer, but there's nothing in your way, go after it. Many times, however, things are at odds, just as we experience service and cost efficiency being at odds with one another. Well. As we introduce the sustainability dimensions, guess what? That's yet another complicated dimension, one that we're not very accustomed to measuring that is introduced into our decision-making logic. And yeah, that, uh, that, that has, to, we gotta step up our game. But again, technologies can help us to get there. Just a little bit more framing of the problem in terms of why it matters. Uh, I teach, uh, supply chain management here at UT. And I impart to my students that I believe today's consumers are diabolical. 
and I don't know if you can identify with this, but we as consumers are more demanding on every dimension of the consumption experience. And what I'm trying to, to, to illustrate here are some of the trends that I've witnessed, you know, that we were maybe demanding to diabolical as we look at these several different dimensions around service, around costs, around liberal returns policies and, and such. And, and really where we've migrated is to being incredibly powerful in the supply chain. I argue that consumers are the most powerful force, more powerful than manufacturers, distributors, and retailers today, in part because we're all equipped with these devices and we, we hold an immense amount of power and influence right there in the palm of our hands routinely. And so you see these shifts and right down to that very final point, you see high quality products to a greater concern for environmental and societal awareness in the products we buy and, and use. And I would argue that we're seeing mental shifts, not from either or, but rather, and we want all of these things. And by the way, we're not only all consumers, but you're in business, you're also a business decision maker. And I would imagine you bring these same expectations into the business to business dialogue that you engage with your suppliers and your business customers in part to you. So what I'm expressing here, yeah, it's a little bit specific to consumer setting, but I would argue that we see the very same thing in business to business settings as well. Just to take it a step further, the volumes of e-commerce are escalating dramatically. 30, that here you see the holiday shopping season that we just completed recently, and you see the steady march in holiday sales in the United States for e-commerce trade. And the percentages that you see above the bars represent the percentage growth. And what you'll notice is that 2019 to 2020, a very large uh, elevation in, in volume and that amounted to 32% growth, which was just off the charts, kind of representative of what we saw throughout much of the year 2020. Also, we need to recognize that 30% of e-commerce products come back. Now that compares to about 7% of product that comes back through conventional brick and mortar retail. So when we take our commerce uh, online, those consumers are incredibly demanding. They want incredible variety. They want speedy delivery. They want free shipping. They want free returns, no questions asked returns. And this is what we see a great deal of that product come back. And we've got to ask ourselves, how sustainable is that? Well, from an environmental standpoint, it's not very sustainable in part because Think about the supply chain provision of delivering full pallets to retail, the conventional brick and mortar retail. That's fairly efficient. We have several decades of efficiencies baked into full pallet accommodation to retail. And then of course the last mile piece is accommodated by the consumer, him or herself, going in, filling up a shopping basket and, and transporting those items home. That has been a very efficient way to reach the market. And also with the returns piece, they bring those products back to, to the store often where they purchase them. Very efficient, particularly for the business. What we're seeing now is a tremendous shift that is creating economic burdens, environmental burdens, and yes, perhaps also societal burdens as we talk about more traffic, we talk about more pollution, we talk about more packaging. Uh, we talk about gig economy, a lot of concerns around what this new economy means to uh, sustainability. It's very challenging. Now, that said, we've made some very significant strides uh, over the years. And this word cloud uh, depicted uh, with a bright, sunshiny day, as you see here, uh, a lot of things, some of which you indicated in your poll, uh, you're implementing. And a lot of these things are around greenness, but also you see the worker safety, you see charitable activities, uh, some things that maybe you might not originally incorporate into your sustainability strategy. Well, that brings 
again, that third dimension of societal benefit into the equation. And, and frankly, what we're seeing here are things that are, are good for the business, but maybe they haven't been kept track as, as business opportunities and business gains. And so it might be just a matter of taking score in a little different way on some of these things, but we have made considerable strides in environmental and societal benefit. Getting back to that notion of reframing the problem, a lot of words on the screen here, and I encourage you to read through this, but this is, uh, is all about a general sentiment that I see oftentimes in, uh, in supply chain operations where we just need to reframe the problem. And here you see a scenario where a transportation manager says, hey, our corporate sustainability and risk group wanted us to to start talking about pounds of CO2, carbon dioxide. And this organization was not very well equipped to do that. And it didn't mean much to the transportation operators to be talking about CO2. But when you talk about reducing miles, getting better utilization of trucks, improving backhaul efficiency, as this transportation manager said, now we get that. And often that's what we need to do in our warehouses as well. Again, this is a transportation example, but it also applies within the four walls of a, a, a warehouse or distribution operation. And over to the right, I imagine this is language that many of you recognize as operational excellence, lean, Six Sigma sort of efforts to simplify the work, to reduce the non-value added steps. That results in processes that are faster, more reliable and safer. And as a result, then we have workers that are invested, safer, prouder, and more productive, and in turn, customers and suppliers that are more loyal and invested. It's a beautiful series of, of, of fallout, if you will, when we can be leaner and greener, and yes, more sustainable. In the warehouse itself, I know many of you are coming from warehouse perspective, um, I like to just underscore that we have two environments in warehousing. We've got the internal environment and we've got the external environment. And what I want to convey with this, this slide is that these things are in concert with one another. That we want to have a highly productive environment. Well, that means that we have a high performing warehouse that translates into good things beyond the four walls. We want to have labor health and safety within the four walls. Well, we're also concerned about community health and safety. And, and so on. And, and so good performance in both environments contributes to a business that people want to work for, other organizations want to do business with, and regulators don't have to fret about. So it really means just taking the things that you're trying to do within the four walls, however you might define them, and taking them a little bit beyond the confines of those four walls. All right, getting to the technologies. And this is a, a deliverable, um, and time is going fast for me here, so I'm gonna actually uncover the scene and thinking. Uh, at the University of Tennessee, we worked with some colleagues at Ohio State University, and we broke down digitalization in terms of seeing, thinking, and doing, and recognize that that helped to, to resonate this concept of digitalization better than in uh, then if you just throw out the term digitalization, people's minds just start racing and they can't quite grasp onto anything. So here you see some definitions for how we define seeing and thinking. And seeing is about creating better visibility of product and process flows. And a lot of great technologies are out there. A lot of new advents are there to help us and are accelerating uh, our ability to see not only within the confines of our operations, but beyond, uh, further upstream and downstream in the supply chain. Uh, some of them are gaining a lot of notoriety, things like blockchain, but there's some simpler technologies out there that enhance the end-to-end -end visibility that we need to embrace. And once we can see, well, we're more informed and we can think deeper and faster thanks to today's technologies to do, uh, employ artificial intelligence, machine learning to be smarter maybe in redesigning our supply chains. If we have smarter supply chain designs, we need fewer facilities. Fewer facilities means a smaller footprint. Uh, that's good not only economically, but also from an environmental and, and societal standpoint. 
We're getting really excited about the implementation of descriptive and predictive analytics to, again, be smarter, maybe even anticipate uh, that uncertain future. And then finally, the doing, and this is where my friends at Kerber Supply Chain are so effective at the doing, things like autonomous operations, bringing autonomous mobile robots and cobots into the business. Robots as a service, RAAS, as you see here, as well as some of the other things that have a lot of promise, like 3D printing and ways to achieve mass customization. Those technologies, again, often are dissociated with our pursuits of sustainability, but really they can go hand in hand. And again, our subsequent class sessions, we got three more class sessions that are going to go into deeper dives on how these technologies can help us to be not only more efficient, but greener and also uh, more societally um, conscious. So I'm gonna quickly wrap up here so I can open up to questions. And here you see some of my takeaway points. Uh, just quickly, sustainability calls for a broader, more holistic view to the business. Often it's a matter of reframing the problem, me measuring different inputs and outputs. Uh, just as a side point, I encourage you to add sustainability to your value stream mapping efforts, not just tracking the time of processes and the inventory that flows through your value streams, but also at looking at things like energy consumption, water consumption, uh, damage and, and uh, injuries, things of that sort can also be tracked and added to your value stream maps. Advanced technologies can make our operations smarter, more efficient, and higher performing. And this is a, a little bit of encouragement, a little nudge here in this next point. The sooner you experiment, the quicker you learn, gain advantage, and see benefits. I know that there's a tendency to, hey, let's let someone else go out there, experiment, prove the technology, prove the method, but hey, um, it's, it's out there waiting for you, and perhaps the opportunity to gain advantage in your business is out there. And this final point is a strong assertion, you know, an assertion that goes back to the 1980s that quality uh, is free. Well, I also believe that sustainability pays for itself, uh, particularly when we can find those creative solutions that deliver on all three bottom lines.